Huh? Are you saying that um, that, that advice doesn't have any foundation when the um, when the scholars or the students give the advice that if you want to be close to the law, stay away from women and all that kind of thing? Well, what I'm wondering, like when I read this, this Alpha Zelda breaking the desires, it talks in the introduction about his influence of all, like Plato and all these different like Western philosophers, and then it starts talking about women as the snares of the devil. And, I mean, do you think that some of that like seeps in there, or is it? I think you know. I think what Imam Al Ghazali was talking about. He is talking about two fundamental desires within the human uh, being. One of them is the stomach, and the other is the genitals. And he's saying that if that these, if we can master these, then we become masters of ourselves. If we can't master these, then we're slaves to ourselves. Now, for a man, those relate to, uh, you know, one of them relates to their desire for women. You know, zuyina nasi hubu shahwati min al nisa, and that's one of the things. Now, that I is equally as applicable to women as well in relation to men. Right? I mean, I think that that what is being said there can be equally applied uh, for women in terms of men, in relation to men. Although men definitely uh, have a more difficult time, right, in these matters than women. One of the, and this is changing in the modern times, you know, particularly in this country. But that is not something that has traditionally been the situation. Men uh, are... are uh, are weaker in these matters. In fact, it's very clear he says in the Quran, Khuriqad insanu da'ifa, that man was created weak in relation to women. That there's the, the women have a, a strength that men don't have. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, for instance, that, that a woman's uh, capacity for sexual enjoyment is actually greater than a male's. And in, in one uh, by 99 parts. And he said, except Allah has has made modesty so uh, overbearing in a woman. There's a modesty that Allah has placed in women that he didn't place in men, right? And this is why it's quite rare in, in cultures all over the world, you know, uh, I mean, you don't find women traditionally uh, doing a lot of the crude things that men will do, you know, in relation to these things. So it's certainly not talking about, it is talking about the idea that a man must learn to control that. And if he doesn't, then he is susceptible uh, to being, to losing himself. To about what? What's that? What's that in Ali Imran? It's in Ali Imran. It means that, you know, for men, it has been made uh, beautiful to a man, uh, the lusty desire for women. That that's something man is attracted to. But Allah is saying that that's something he needs to overcome. You know, but there's definitely, that is a, is a very strong attraction within the male uh, species, right? And part of the, and this is part of the reason is that the hijab is in a sense really th the onus has been put on the woman out of the weakness of the man. For instance, a man, now look at this, a man can walk in the street with his uh, shirt off. Now it is not permissible for a woman to look at the man's uh, chest if it's an Ajnabi man. But the onus wasn't put on men because women are not seen, you know, Allah is saying that they're not as weak as men are in that area, that that type of attraction, I mean, women, really, most women, certainly traditionally, and I think still to this day, are just, they're, they're not just, you know, they're men that will just go off. If they see a woman, they get seduced. There's a tradition about Daud, alayhi salam, saw all of these worshippers, and, and he was admiring them. And Allah said, if I sent one woman to these men, um, they would just go off with her. You know, in other mm -hmm. words, what, you think they're great or bad, but the reality of it is, is you know, they don't have uh, an inner strength. Right? So that is the type of weakness that, that the, the male has been given. I think males are more aware of it because we, it's, this is our, you know, we're, this is our experience. 
right? And it isn't the female experience. It's the male experience. Now, there are female experiences that we're not aware of, right? I and mean, that's just, this is the human condition. Now, I had a teacher who was a male feminist. Uh, he was a teacher that taught me epistemology, and one of the books we had to read was uh, Towards a Feminist Epistemology. And one of the things, his argument was that a man, it's impossible for a man to understand the, the, the feminine condition. I mean, he just felt it's impossible. We can't do it. We're incapable of understanding it. And, and I disagreed with him in that I said that I think that the essential experiences uh, about, I, I, for instance, there are many women that have experienced oppression. Right? Now, Although I cannot experience the female experience of oppression, I know what oppression is and I know my reaction to it because I have been oppressed and I think everybody in this room at some time in their life has felt oppression and they've felt the experiences that go with it, right? So we do have uh, bonds and connections. You know, we've felt pain, we've felt uh, anguish, we've felt love, we've felt hate, we've felt jealousy. These are shared human experiences. And, and these are things that can bind us and, and, and uh, keep us together. Uh-huh. This is one of the uh, feminists came to, you know, one of the sheikhs and, uh, you know, said it's very unfair that, you know, when you have the salam, you know, that the men are in front and the women in front. Right. And the sheikh said, well, why do you put the women in front and see how the men do, <laughs> you know? Right, they'll lose their the prayer. Men, you know, because they won't <laughs> That's last true. long. That's true. I mean, the fact that women are, are pray behind the men, it's, it's a clear yeah. indication there that that is not a major distraction for a woman in the way it is for a man. So most of the statements about, you know, when you say women are snares of evil and stuff, it's... it's in it relates to an inherent it. flaw in the male. It's, right. it's a exactly. fundamental weakness in the male, exactly. right? It really is. Yeah. It's not about the woman. It's, in right. fact, something about the male. What's that? Why, why is it worded like that? I mean, that doesn't make sense to say that women are evil. <laughs> no, I, none, the Prophet said, never says that women are evil. There's no... And also another thing, these are bad translations, because a lot of times they talk about shar, and I mentioned that shar in Arabic is not a moral. It has to do with uh, more with a want than it has to do with uh, the idea of evil. Right. I mean, there's some, I've seen this in the Muslim books, and, and personally, I don't, it just, it bothers me, you know. Is, is Al-Ghazali just saying that um, both men and women should have purified parts before they get married? Is that what he's saying? Definitely, they should at least be on the path of, of attempting to purify their hearts. You know, I don't think that you should delay marriage until you have, you know, feel like you're in a state of purity or ikhlas or something like that. You know, you might end up getting married at about 60 or 70. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and Allah's also made, you know, there's, there's natural attractions. Lust is part of the human condition. That is a natural attraction uh, b uh, between a male and a female. That's not, that's not something abnormal. It's not something bad. What, what the Sharia is saying is if you can't control that, you're in trouble. You have to be able to control it. Then the idea is that you will not be susceptible to falling into something that is a major wrong action. Because your taqwa, the mechanism within your soul, will prevent you from doing that. 